Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the great pleasure of welcoming back to the channel, John McHugh. How are you, John? I am good, Esoteric. Thank you for having me back on. Um, it's a treat. Uh, we're going to get have the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite icons of uh, power and uh, just, just joy for that matter, uh, Pegasus, because you've known about it since you were a kid. Everybody's heard about Pegasus. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting story about how this peculiar image came into being. Can you see my screen, Mr. No, you can't. Hang on a sec. Sorry. There we go. So what happens when you spend all your time uh, in ancient studies rooms study <laughs> translating? <laughs> you can't do anything on a computer. <laughs> so here we go. Um, all right, let me just get myself going here. Let me get myself going. Here we go. There we go. There it goes. So, um, yeah, so I mentioned the origin of Pegasus in this Celestial Code of Scripture, uh, which is the book, The Astral Cipher, underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and Quran. My publisher, Monkhouse, uh, Monkfish, excuse me, uh, wants to have me try to plug the book every chance I can. So there it is. And uh, I just want to, this is really the gist of the whole book and everything I'm going to present to you, even in the uh, episode I'm about to discuss with Pegasus. So uh, when I was in grad school, I really stumbled onto this arcane celestial thinking paradigm, unlike anything we embrace today. Um, this esoteric doctrine held that the constellations depicted still frames of all of the momentous incidents that had taken place on Earth in the distant past. Alternate readings for the cuneiform signs that were used to spell out the constellation titles in each tableau divulged the action and the details that were going on. So, in the, you know, and this is really the, the key. In the ancient world, the constellations depicted this infallible repository of mythical history, uh, which cuneiform sources, they, call, they actually refer to it as heavenly writing or Lamashi writing, which means constellation writing. Religious astrologers like the Magi, who uh, followed the star Bethlehem to the birth site of baby Jesus, they arranged the, uh, these jumbled array of stellar pictures uh, and their, their accompanying communiques into uh, stories, into narratives, and then translated them into writing as pagan scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Quran. So the gist of it is that Miracles were possible in the ancient world because of the system by which history was recorded. Today, we only rely on science. We wouldn't look at pictures in the stars to explain our past. And that, that's one of the big uh, paradigm shifts that I, that I explore in the book. So the book explains uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden can be translated to a stellar picture story. Noah's flood and ark, which uh, we've touched on already. Samson's slaughter of a thousand men with the donkey's jawbone. There's a donkey's jawbone constellation. Um, Jonah's three-day confinement in the sea monster's belly. Uh, Jesus's virgin birth in sea walk. Uh, in Revelation, you have the, the woman, child, and dragon scene from Revelation 12, directly out of Babylonian star atlases. St. Christopher, who's a giant who carried baby Jesus across a, 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 a perilous river. And the Islamic claim that the Quran was based on a stellar tablet in heaven. And uh, Muhammad's encounter with the angel Gabriel. All of these can be traced to picture stories in the stars. And that's what the celestial code of scripture is all about. Um, so if you just had to summarize it again, you know, the, the core of what I go into in the book and what I'm going to go into right now is that the ancients conceptualized the constellations as still frames of characters and props engaging in the incidents that made them immortal. So you're literally when you look at the constellations you're looking at the scenes from religious history that allowed the gods to become immortal and be placed in heaven. And then 
beyond this, you get the, the idea of a picture in the stars makes sense because you can think of picture books and, and uh, you know, snapshots or, you know, pictures, still frames. But the action in these still frames is divulged through um, basically secret encryptions in the constellation's original cuneiform spelling. So you have a picture in the stars. Maybe it's made up of three or four constellations. When you write down the cuneiform spelling of those constellations, each cuneiform sign has multiple meanings. And those secondary meanings end up defining the action that you see in the religious myth. And that's really what the book is exploring. So it explains how the star gods uh, related to each other in these, these heavenly picture stories that were then recorded as, as factual history in the genre we today call religious mythology. Remember, religious mythology, they're narratives, but deities are present and there are just miracles or what we today would call a hiatus in natural law. They're all over the place. And when you look in the constellations, every single constellation is, is delineated, uh, gesticulating a miracle. I mean, they're, they're, they're just all over the night sky. So, so I thought we could have some fun with today's episode. I, I just decided to call it, uh, I, I use turquoise because it's my favorite color, but uh, the cuneiform celestial puns that produce Pegasus birth story and explains why the god uh, ocean is portrayed as, as a river that encircles the earth. And it's, you know, these are where it was published. The articles were published. Um, couple of them there on archaeoastronomy and ancient technologies. And then one of them was in migration and diffusion. And these were these articles are about five or six years old. So um, this was a while back, a little while back anyway. So Pegasus, you know, it's a flying horse whose appearance is cut off at the belly button. You know, how did that happen? Uh, and by the way, just so your readers understand, when you see Pegasus upright, you know that north is to the south and uh, south is at the top of your screen because you know when you're looking up at pegasus and the north stars at your back pegasus is, is an upside down constellation which again doesn't make any sense so uh the first ref reference to pegasus uh shows up in hesiod's theogony uh, around 700 bc so uh it, th there are allusions to the theme in homer but he never writes about, Homer never writes about Pegasus. Uh, Hesiod uh, recounts Pegasus' birth story. He says that the flying horse was named Pegasus. Literally, the word means springs, as in bodies of water, you know, fresh running water. Uh, because he was born near the springs, the Pegasus, of the god ocean. So Pegasus flew away and left the earth and came to the deathless gods. Notice that there's no wings. Pegasus is flying without wings. Uh, this was Pegasus catasterism. The, the word catasterism um, is, uh, it, it, it's literally the Greek term that means placing among the stars. It's how the star gods came to be deities and were transformed into, this, into the sky, um, delineating the amazing deeds and feats that caused them to become immortal. That's what you're seeing. Um, one of the crucial points here that we're going to talk about is that uh, he said he said seems to already know the story. Um, so it makes you wonder how did if Homer doesn't mention it, how did Hesius know this story? Is there a pre-existing text? And I'm going to say, yeah, there really was a pre-existing text, and that pre-existing text was the heavenly writing of the Mesopotamian night sky. So. This episode is going to focus on, uh, you, we'll find later that Hesiod relied heavily on the writings of the Babylonians and Assyrians, especially their uh, creation epic, Enuma Elish, in, in when he composed uh, Theogony, which is his signature you know, uh, work. Enuma Elish was one of the reference manuals of the Mesopotamian astronomer. So all of a sudden, Hesiod's relying on a Mesopotamian myth to produce theogony. And you're like, whoa, 
something's going on here. He's either got one heck of a, uh, a tutor, maybe even a Babylonian, or maybe he actually knows something about Mesopotamian astrological uh, esoterica and, uh, you know, arcana. So Hesed's reliance on Enumel Ish presupposes knowledge of astronomical arcana re revered by the Mesopotamian astronomers. And, you know, so uh, it's this esoteric celestial wisdom that exposes the basis of Pegasus' birth from the severed head of Medusa and the appearance of the flying horse's twin, Chrysar. The, it's the golden sword. That's what the, the entity's name and this deity's name is, literally golden sword. It also unveils the astronomical identity of the Greek god Ocean and explains why he was just absolutely incongruously described as a river that encircles the earth. It, it just doesn't even make any sense. You know, the sailors of the Aegean knew what the difference between a river and the ocean was. And how could they make that mistake with the god Ocean? So, and I just, to be a little flipping funny, I just thought I'd throw in with no extra cost. So uh, you'll notice that the cuneiform spelling for Pegasus can render Barak in Arabic. And Barak is the flying steed or the flying horse that Muhammad flies on in sort of 17 of the Quran. Uh, he flies on this, this winged horse. Um, to go from the uh, the mosque in Mecca to the mosque in Jerusalem, and he does it instantaneously. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, when you talk about the origin of the constellations and Pegasus, um, you know, there's from from Britain is uh, Edwin Charles Krupp, E. C. Krupp, one of the greatest archaeoastronomers of all time. He says that most specialists are convinced that many Greek constellations were imported from Mesopotamia, although the routes by which they arrived are neither clear nor embraced by consensus. And his, he's making the assumption that constellation origins were based on diffusion, just knowledge of information. I, I'm saying that that's dead wrong, that there's actually a system of thought that produced the Greek constellations and that becomes apparent when you look at Pegasus and the god Ocean. So uh, constell Pegasus and, and all of the Mesopotamian constellations, you see a map there. The belief is that constellations come out of Mesopotamia there. They go onto the Syrian uh, coast where you see uh, Tyre and uh, Byblos, uh, where it says the word Levant there in the middle of your screen. That's the Syrian coast. Ugarit's up north. Ugarit is where you have the one of the first alphabets it's a cuneiform alphabet. I think it has 26 different cuneiform signs used to write an alphabet. It's called Ugaritic. And what you're getting is Mesopotamians are trading on the, on the coast of Syria. Uh, and uh, Greeks are coming to uh, the coast of Syria to exchange their goods. So the, a, a, a real mercantile centers there on the Syrian coast. And that's where the Greek alphabet comes from. It's based on Phoenician. Phoenician's just, it's just Canaanite. Um, and you get the alphabetic script, Aleph, Beit. I mean, they're, they're all Hebrew Canaanite letters. Aleph just means bull, Beit means house. So the alphabet, literally, there's no word alpha in Greek and there's no word beta, uh, beta in Greek. It's based on alpha, Beit, which means bull, house. The first letter is bull, Second word's house, third word's door stopper, and that's how you memorize the alphabet. So it's so even the alphabet itself suggests that the whole system of learning the alphabet came from uh, from at least from Syria. So so we're saying that Hesiod is in is basically at least tutored, if not cognizant, of Mesopotamian astrological lore. Um, so we need to know a little bit about astrological lore from Mesopotamia. So one of the things to think about is Mesopotamian astronomers were one class of scholar or expert. Um, they're sometimes referred to as Umanu. Um, and they were proficient in one or more of the occult arts that involved inter interlocuting with the gods. They were the astronomer, astro astrologer. They were the diviner, the exorcist, 
um, the lamentation chanter and um, uh, the physician. Uh, so there were there were there were the main skills, but the thing about calling yourself a scholar or an expert in Amanu, it often implied an expertise in every one of those subject matters. Um, so the Mesopotamian astrologer is, um, uh, they, they're an expert in this astrological handbook called Enuma Enuelish. It, it's just the, predictoring, the predictive system that's used to prognosticate the future in celestial divination from Mesopotamia. But the title of the astrologer is extraordinary. It's Tupsharu, which means, it literally means writer. And what Tupsharu were doing, these writers were doing, they, they were expert linguists. They possessed uh, reading uh, knowledge of, not only were they expert in their own spoken tongue of Akkadian, but they also knew the ancient Sumerian language, um, which the Sumerians were the ones who invented the cuneiform script which was later adopted by the Akkadian speakers that we know today as the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So um, the most famous uh, Tupsharu come from, of course, the New Testament. So, you know, when Matthew says that um, these, uh, the, you know, the mag, in Greek, it's magoi. Um, it's the, the, you often hear the term magi or magi. They're, they often refer to them as Persian priests, which they were, I think it's like a sixth century BC term. But by the time the gospels are being written down, the term for magus um, was kind of muddled with the identity of the Babylonian astrologer. And it's almost unequivocal if you talk to theologians that the, the astrologers that showed up at Jesus's birth were Babylonian astrologers specifically. And again, their title is you know, uh, which literally is author. Um, so the, the Tupsharu, the writers, they viewed the stars in constellations as literally right out of cuneiform star atlases. Shittir Shamei, which is writing of the heavens. Shittir Buume, uh, which is like, uh, you could call it uh, celestial writing would be the best translation. Burume just refers to like speckled, like the sky is speckled. Um, uh, Shittir T Shamami, you see that one much less frequently, but it's the same thing. It means writing of the heavens or writing of the sky. So the other piece of this that's really fascinating is um, King Esarhaddon, there he is right there. He's an er early seventh century BC king from Assyria. And this guy, he says he writes his name on this one stone inscription, this big monument. He says he writes his name in Lumashi writing, which is constellation writing. And it, this implies, how can I say this? The, the thinking paradigms and the precepts of the astrologers were secret. Him using that and saying, I'm writing my name in Lamashi writing is the only, the only correlate I, correlate I have today is think of, think of Donald Trump and his Twitter account. There are so many people that wish they could just take his Twitter account away because he was bragging about this or confronting somebody about that. And it's almost like King Esther Haddon had revealed one of the most secret, one of the trade secrets of the astrologers is that we write, we write in this constellation writing in these, these puns that are embedded in the constellations, images, and titles. And he either brazenly or unknowingly reveals that he's using this system. Um, it's very fascinating. So, so the other thing that's interesting about the Tupsharu, remember the name means writer or, or uh, author. So the word for astrologer is writer and author because they are just the most erudite linguists that exist on earth. They are unbelievable. They are the editors of the Tel Vachahasis, which is the original Babylonian creation story and the first flood. They are the, uh, the writers and editors of the uh, Gilgamesh epic. Remember the Gilgamesh epic was written by an exorcist, an Umanu. And if you're an Umanu, you might identify yourself as an exorcist, but you're an expert in astrology too. Um, they are definitely writing the Enuma Elish, uh, the Babylonian creation myth, 
and you, it's a Syrian creation myth too. Um, the other thing they're, they're astutely aware of is these Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries. Um, so they're retaining Sumerian words using these things called Sumerian logograms. And I'll, I'll talk about them in a second, but, but these are the keys to understanding how to read the night sky like a text. So, so whence, if, we if you can accept that as a working hypothesis, the Akkadian language and the constellations uh, were transmitted into the Hel Hellenic cultural sphere, along with the conviction that the astral sky was a hallowed text that imparted revelation through wordplay in a manner exemplified by Enuma Elish Tablet 7. Conceptualizing the constellation this as heavenly writing that framed momentous historic events whose details were imparted through wordplay encrypted in constellations cuneiform spelling provides the cipher which allows us to discern the astronomical origin of Pegasus and the myth, myth recounting its birth. So now we're at the fun stuff. Okay, so how does our fun little Pegasus, like our flying horse, well, how did that happen? Well, there are the stars of Pegasus. I think the, um, the Griffith Observer allowed me to use this photo, so I want to thank them. I think it was Ed e. C. Krupp who allowed me to use this photo. Um, uh, but this is the Griffith Observer is the observatory is the big observatory in Los Angeles, one of the biggest in America. So how the Mesopotamian field constellation morphed into a flying horse whose image is cut off at the belly button. So in Mesopotamia, this is what New Year's Day was was marked by. The rising of Luhunga, the hired worker constellation, literally the cuneiform signs read man hired worker. Um, and he's standing next to his plow in the field that he is uh, assigned to till, divinely assigned to till. This is the very basis of economic stability in Mesopotamia. Irrigated fields that were, uh, that were you know, uh, worked by, by hired workers. Um, and so this is what you would have seen day in, day out in Mesopotamia. And it was depicted in the stars because everything that existed depended on this. This this was civilization, sort of the way maybe today civilization, we identify civilization as you've got constant electricity. They would have known you've got constant food because of this, this image and replicating this image and knowing when to plant and when to harvest, which is what the astrologers were. They were the time wreck reckoners of the society. So there it is on the calendar of Dendera. That's about 60 BC. That temple of Hathor was built around 60 BC. And that's one of the, so it's on a couple images in uh, Egypt. And that's one of the, that's Greco-Roman Egypt. What's interesting is they don't depict Pegasus. They depict the Mesopotamian field constellation straddled by Pisces, because that's how it appears in the stars. So remember, when you see Pegasus right side up, you know north is at the bottom of your screen and south is at the, uh, at the excuse me, yeah, south is at the top of your screen. And so there's the field constellation. So you might say, well, that doesn't really look like a horse. It looks like a square in the sky. And by the way, it's when you look at it in the night sky, it looks far more square than it shows up on these uh, hand-drawn images by my illustrators. Well, Iku is the ancient Mycenaean word for horse. Um, so it, the, the oldest spoken Greek, the word for horse was pronounced ac exactly like the Mesopotamian word for field, which may have been the beginning of the impetus to transform these stars into a flying horse. But there's more. In cuneiform, you know, there are many different ways to write the field constellation. In astronomical titles, it often shows up, and actually in the Epic of Gilgamesh, because this constellation is also the, the flood boat in Mesopotamia. Um, in the Babylonian, in the Babylonian, Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 11, this is the flood boat, this ashy coup. So in, in cuneiform uh, astronomical texts, it's often writ written ashiku, literally ash means one. Iku just means field. The reason is Iku is 
it's a measurement of surface area. It's basically a 60 meter cube. And it's the equivalent of the English word like acre. Uh, and so it's to identify it as just one acre, they would often write the cuneiform sign ash, which just means one. However, ash has a whole bunch of other readings and meanings. Ash can mean, uh, uh, ash can be read dal, and dal is the Sumerian word for flying. Iku, we just saw, I'm going right down the list here. Iku, we just saw, means horse in archaic Greek. In the uh, Sumerian Akkadian dictionaries, Iku is pronounced like that. It's written with cuneiform signs, Iku. And the Ku sign, uh, it forms a homophone uh, with the word cutoff. Ku number five is cut. Ku just means cut off in Sumerian, chopped off. Ku can also be read door, and door means belly button. So you have a flying horse cut off at the belly button. And when you look up at Pegasus, you have a flying horse cut off at the belly button. Now, I may be Polish, but I'm pretty sure that that is the inspiration for uh, the Mesopotamian field con constellation being redelineated as a flying horse. But, there, but there's even, even more. Remember, when you find those puns, flying horse cut off at the navel, there's the, the thinking paradigm. Hidden words are the secrets of the gods. And if you're thinking like a Mesopotamian astrologer and you found those hidden words, you would be predisposed to see them as a form of epiphany or revelation, which I believe is the inspiration for Pegasus. There's a, there's a little bit more reason as well. So remember, the night sky is considered celestial writing. We saw that in earlier slide. So one of the beliefs is that some of these cuneiform signs, which are comprised of wedges, are actually based on how they look. So if a cuneiform sign resembles a constellation, it serves as kind of an astroglyph for that constellation. Well, one of the square cuneiform signs is called the Lagab sign. Again, it's got like 18 different readings. One of them is core. And core just means, again, there's, there, there, there's like, I, I can't remember. It's something like 24 different core ways to read core. Like they have different, different cuneiform signs that can be read core. But in Sumerian, they're not reading core number two, core number three, core number four. The homophones make it so that you'd love to take spelling tests in cuneiform because you would never fail. You'd, there's so many different ways to write a word correctly. Anyway, so core, lagab can be read core. It matches up with cuneiform sign for uh, iku, which is that square cuneiform sign in the sky. Core is also the word uh, that means to change a name or a borderline. And it, ironically, it's also a Sumerian term that means, uh, excuse me, an Assyrian term that means horse. So anyway, uh, you have a lot of reasons to, this may be the inspiration of why they transformed the, the square field constellation into the flying horse Pegasus. I think it's just literally, it was imparted directly from that celestial wisdom that this cuneiform sign was the astroglyph for that constellation. So, now we go into you know the celestial cuneiform puns and inspired uh, Pegasus birth story. So you know here's here's how it reads in Theogony. It's on verses uh, 280 through 282. It says, and when Perseus cut off her, meaning Medusa's head, there sprang forth uh, the great Crusar, the golden sword, and the horse Pegasus, who was so called because he was born near the springs of ocean. So that is. Uh, per, uh, uh, per Pegasus um, first, it, it's, you know, debut on the mythological stage. There's where it shows up with Hesiod. And you can see it in the night sky. You can see in the middle of your screen on the right side, you'll see Perseus carrying Medusa's head. To the left, towards the center, you see Pegasus, how he appears in the sky upside down. And it was always believed that the myths were written and they were depicted in the constellations. My theory is not that at all. 
My theory is that the constellations and the stories arose at the same times. The Greeks, uh, Greek hostages like Homer knew how to read the celestial sky of Mesopotamia and they took cuneiform signs. They translated the alternate readings for the, these cuneiform signs into stories and these stories became indigenous Greek mythology. The, sacred, the Greek scriptures that we, we read today, like the Agony. So, so there's the image. So I just want to point out a few things. It's kind of fun. So Iku, the square constellation of the field, that's the cuneiform sign it's written with, is the Sumerian logogram. It, it can also be read car, because it, it's written on an incline sometimes. Sometimes it's written straight, and they read it car. Sometimes they read it on an incline. It, it's called the... It's called Tanu. It means the cuneiform sign on an incline. It's the same cuneiform sign. But the inclined Iku can be read car. And sometimes they, they read Iku as car, K-A-R, with a two next to it. It's the exact cuneiform, cuneiform uh, Sumerian cuneiform term for Perseus, which is remarkable. Now, be, to be clear, Perseus isn't this swashbuckling hero in Mesopotamia. His title literally means old man. So how they turned him into a swashbuckling hero, uh, I'm not 100% certain. But one of the things that's interesting is that the Sumerian title for, Perse for Perseus is embedded in this cuneiform sign, a homophone in this cuneiform sign. So then we have Medusa. Her name literally means ruling. You know, it means in the act of ruling or, or yeah, lourdicing. So look at our Iku sign, the field constellation, right? Remember, the Sumerian logogram is in capitals. It's Iku. The, the name is sort of like the word acre. So if I said, oh, I have an acre of land. Let me take you out and show you my land. Iku is its surface area. We don't use it as the word for like field or farm. It's got a different word. So when you're talking about the actual image in that constellation, it means igu. Uh, igu just means field. Ironically, igu is the Sumerian logogram that means springs. And the way to write springs in Akkadian is inu. And inu just means ruling. So they would have looked at a cuneiform sign. They would have said, oh, it's, a, it's an Iku. The image it depicts is an Igu. Igu is also the word that means springs. And in Babylonian and Assyrian, um, springs is written Enu. And Enu is the word for Medusa. And that might be how Medusa appears in this story. Igu is also read she. It just means her. It's just a pronoun, just means her. So you start putting them together and you have a whole bunch of, of, of um, puns here. So you have Iku on the lower left hand there. It can be read car, which is the cuneiform sign, one of the Sumerian logograms for Perseus. Remember, Iku can be pronounced Iku. The Ku sign can mean cut off. Iku is also read Ashag, which means head. Uh, the image of uh, the field that's in the sky is igu, and igu, it's a, the Sumerian logogram that it represents is springs, and springs is written with a cuneiform sign that, you know, can be read anu, which means ruling Medusa. That same cuneiform sign can be read igi, which means you know, which also means Perseus is actually two, near, two cuneiform signs there that correlate with uh, Perseus. And it can also be read she, which means her. So in these cuneiform titles, you have Medusa, Perseus cuts off her head, which is exactly what happens in the original account of the, the first explanation for uh, Pegasus birth. Perseus is present, Medusa is present, Perseus cuts off her head. So, so then you continue, and I remember I said Iku, 
they, they tell you the pronunciation. They say, oh, well, we pronounce it e ku And so you end up with e ku OK, so either they don't seem to be looking for any puns there. Ku has a whole bunch of different meanings. One of the ways to read ku is as ush, which means gold. One of the ways to read ku is as gear, which means sword. One of the ways to read ku is as good, which means to spring forth. So suddenly you have spring forth, cryosaur, or golden sword. So you literally have the words gold sword springs forth right embedded in the, the spelling of Iku, the Mesopotamian title for the, the main stars of Pegasus. Go on further. You know, they, they're often writing the celestial determinative, which is the mool sign. One of the mool signs, as we saw earlier, is mool two. Again, a whole bunch of word plays show up here. Multu can also mean near, okay? Ash can be read asha, which is the word because. Iku, we just saw, is the ancient uh, ar archaic Greek term for horse. Iku is how you pronounce that lo Sumerian logogram. Ku means to be born. Uh, Igu, which is the image of the field. Uh, it's a homophone with the Sumerian logogram, igu, which means spring or springs. It can be singular or plural. And igu can also be read pad or she, and they are the Sumerian terms that mean to call by a name. So you end up getting the words because born, he was, you, you render uh, infinitive verbs into their finite form. And one of the ways to render, to call by a name is to render it as he, he called by a name. And near is in the word we just saw is in the celestial determinative mu, and then springs of course is in uh, igu. So you have because he was born near the springs. So how does ocean fit in this, right? So where does ocean? So remember Pegasus is born near the god ocean. So again, this time I have um, the uh, Pegasus and the Aku sign depicted as it appears typically when we look up in the stars. North, north is to the top of your screen, south is to the bottom. It's straddled, the, um, the Aku is straddled by Pisces on its southern end and then on its uh, eastern end uh, over where that the eye on Aku is. So it makes this kind of L. But the southern uh, Pisces fish in, in Babylonian star atlases is the swallow constellation. It's one of the birds that the flood hero releases from the flood boat to see if the waters have subsided. It's, it's depicted right there. You see a swallow kind of drawn over the uh, Pegasus, the upside down Pegasus. So that's what it looked like in ancient Babylonian times there would have been a swallow constellation. Remember, there are many, many titles connected to these star figures. One of them is Maratu, which means rainbow. But rainbow simultaneously means ocean. So you're like, well, where's the god ocean? Well, there he is, he's right there. So this is a god. And remember the Dean gear sign can mean of. So it typically means God, but it can also mean Sha, which is of in Babylonian. So you hear, um, so remember, we talked about the god ocean and springs of the god ocean. Well, the word ocean, the word god, and the word of are embedded right there in that uh, those cuneiform, that, the cuneiform terms for uh, the southern uh, Pisces fish just below the Aku sign, which is about five or seven of Pegasus um, stars. And you see them all marked there. I'm not going to go through every single star. It'll, you can just freeze the frame and go through them so I don't get too pedantic here. So then, now I had to turn it on its side so I can get a really nice picture here. So you have the word ocean, Maratu, embedded in um, the southern fish of Pisces, which straddles the field constellation. So now we look, we put all those word plays together. We have leap forth the horse called springs because he was born near the springs of the god ocean and the god ocean is literally embedded in 
the star figure that is straddling the Aku constellation. So you go a little further, and that's how you would write it in cuneiform. If you were writing, uh, you know, if you were going to write um, uh, the word ocean in cuneiform, Maratu, you would write it Eid Maratu, literally the river ocean. That's how you know it's coming out of Mesopotamia. So you'd write it. So Eid Maratu, all of these star figures are gods. So they all have the din gear sign in front of them, even if they don't write it. Remember, they're trying to shorten the amount of phrasing they've got to use because writing cuneiform is very uh, arduous. So you could write Dingir Eid Muratu, the God River Ocean is how it would show up in uh, in Babylonian, right? So there he is right there. He's, his title is literally embedded in the Southern Pisces fish. So how did this river God, so Homer goes around calling the, the God Ocean, he says he's a river that encircles the earth. Um, and I, you know, I quoted, I quoted the article that I wrote about it in. So you can just check that out. And I think it's in migration and diffusion. But um, so, so how did they get that idea? How did the God Ocean come conceptualized as a river that encircles the earth? Well, first of all, when you write the word ocean, Maratu in cuneiform, you put the Eid, the Eid sign in front of it that it says Eid to, just means river. Right. And of course, it's a deity because it's a star figure. So the, the God Ocean is literally the God River Ocean is how you write the word ocean in cuneiform. However, the uh, field constellation, remember, it's typically written Iku, but there are about, I don't know, there are about four or five different ways to write it uh, as logograms. One of them is with the U5 sign. And U5 also means Kishatu in Babylonian, which just means the, the inhabited earth. The world. So, so you have a river god named Ocean. The world is right next to him. And uh, again, remember that Lagab sign, that square Lagab sign? It, it has about 18 different readings, I think. And one of them is, is Nigin. It just means to encircle. So wordplay embedded in the celestial writing of the star figures right in Pegasus and right around Pegasus reveal the words uh, ocean, the river God encircles the world or the earth. And so that's how I think that, um, that the idea that Homer wrote down that uh, the, the God ocean is a river that encircles the earth. So again, if I just had to summarize, beginning with Homer, a cadre of bilingual cuneiform Greek scholars came into existence. A remnant, a remnant of, their, of their origin is encoded in the eponymous name Homer or hostage. Such bilingual astronomer poets possess the ability to decipher the envelope of cuneiform puns encrypted in the cuneiform titles for the stars of Pegasus. Word play imparted Medusa, Perseus cut off her head, sprang forth Cresor or golden sword, the horse named Pegasus springs forth because he was born near the spring of the god Ocean. All those words are all encrypted in those cuneiform signs. He sees well-known reliance on the new relish implies that he or someone collaborating with him, maybe a tutor, had detected the aforementioned sacred celestial cuneiform puns and translated them into eloquent Greek as lines uh, 280 and 280 through 282 of Theogony. Similar Lamashi writing puns dictated that the god Ocean was a river that encircles the world. And that's probably where Homer got that idea. So I just want to leave you with one last thought. So in Surah 17 of the Quran, Muhammad rides on a flying horse called a burdak. And th this, this flying steed instantaneously transports him from the mosque in Mecca to the one in Jerusalem. And I just want you to just take a look at something. So look at Muli Ku there. Remember, that's the, the cuneiform title for Pegasus. Um, I'm taking out all the vowels there because I'm just going off of that consonantal root, MLK, right? Um, so uh, an M is what's called a bilingual. So when you say, if you, if you, <laughs> you say M, B, and P, and put your hand in front of your mouth, you go M, 
you you feel yourself nasalize the sound. You go buh, you hold the air in. It's called voicing the sound. And puh, you aspirate it. You blow the air out. So those phonemes interchange. So buh, puh, ma, they interchange in ancient languages when when words are uh, uh, when loan words occur. L and R's are liquids. So an L turning into an R, an R turning into an L happens all the time. And a K and a Q are the same. So what you have there with mul iku, you have, you could make an argument that you have BRQ, which is the, the consonantal root for Barak, which is the actual flying steed that Muhammad flies flies on when he goes instantaneously from Mecca to Jerusalem. And I, I'm making the argument that, although I'm not going in depth on it, this is a good start for uh, proving the, uh, the kind of beast, because I'm pretty sure no one's ever seen a beast like that. Uh, and this is how uh, Muhammad instantaneously got from the mosque in uh, Mecca to the mosque in Jerusalem. So. So I hope that wasn't too pedantic. It's the Slavsakota scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And um, it's I do I do um, go into it in the early chapters of of the of the book. And I hope that I just I hate when I have to go through all those arduous, complicated cuneiform spellings and meanings. I'm sorry if I uh, got a little long winded there. John McHugh, thank you for joining Esoteric Thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esoteric. I appreciate it.